Welcome to part two of my conversation with Ishwar K. Puri, McMaster's Dean of Engineering, and Susan Tai, McMaster's Provost and Vice President Academic, and also a member of the Faculty of Engineering. If you missed part one, we reflected on the biggest lessons we learned in 2020 in online teaching and learning, and there were many. In this episode, you'll hear what we believe the future of engineering education holds, and our provost will answer the big question that we all have. Will we be back on campus this fall? Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy. Both of you must keep your eye on what's happening at other universities, particularly in this time, uh, but at any time, uh, both in Canada and abroad. Um, McMaster has a number of things that it can be quite proud of. To the best of my knowledge, uh, I don't think we have a documented case of a transmission of COVID transmission on campus, even though research has been running uh, more or less uh, full, full, full steam ahead for most of the pandemic. Um, we managed the transition to a virtual environment uh, as well as many, but also many other things um, of subtle things like enabling foreign students to be able to come into the country and quarantine appropriately and things such as that. So to your mind, what are the gaps that the pandemic has exposed in the higher educational system, um, both in research and in teaching uh, and in, in managing our student populations, both graduate and undergraduate and managing our faculty, faculty and staff complement and keeping them uh, engaged uh, and and healthy and uh, and allowing them to to uh, you know fulfill their their mission. Susan, I guess I'll begin with you. I was hoping you'd begin with Ishwar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so so I think there are a number of gaps. And I think that when we start to think about how we move forward, certainly, one of the biggest concerns that has come forward with this, with the pandemic and, and post-pandemic are our mental health uh, concerns and how we need to be really supporting, providing the right supports at the right time. And so I think, um, you know, one of the things at McMaster we're doing, we are working very closely with the Okanagan Charter Committee, um, which of course has many of our colleagues in the faculty of health science who are experts in the field of mental health and so so to me i think that that is a gap that making sure that people aren't isolated um, i think that again um, having the right kind of uh, technologies in place i think there was a lot of stress around you know the digital technologies and the virtual learning and will it work and how does it work and how do I um, you know ensure you know from a student perspective how do I ensure that I can get logged in and at the right time and know where I'm going all of those things so so I think we've come a long way in terms of trying to provide stability um, in that area I think that um, one of the most important things that we can do as an institution is to communicate what we're doing and what we're planning on doing and communicate often and early. So I think that, um, you know, if you can be communicating on how we feel things are going to roll out, what are our principles and always, always hold true to our principles, that that goes a long way. I think, um, you know, there are a number of gaps in terms of, um, you know, some of the supports that we need to make sure we have in place. I think that there, um, you know, there are gaps in terms of technologies. Uh, we need to make sure we're investing our resources in places that provide value. So when we are looking at changes that are occurring and we're looking at basically transforming the way we deliver our programs um, making sure that we're investing in the right places so be thoughtful and planning and not just have knee-jerk reactions but really be thoughtful um, try to mitigate problems as they occur but also always be anticipating anticipating solutions um, to what we do so I think I'll leave it there and I will um, let my colleague uh, also add some insight here. Over to you, Eshwar. Thank you. Um, 
Firstly, I, I agree with Dr. Tai that uh, uh, bricks and mortars universities have to double down on the student experience. Um, I think that the future can be very fraught for bricks and mortar universities. The virtual teaching and learning genie is out of the bottle. And there is uh, a small barrier uh, to uh, a large multinational corporation gathering together experts and putting a curriculum together. A curricula for professional programs might prove to be harder to put together than curricula for other programs because of the experiential learning uh, uh, that is embedded in professional programs. But the barrier to a large multinational corporation uh, putting together curricula together uh, for various programs uh, has just diminished over the last year. Take, for example, companies like uh, Google and um, Amazon that have started offering virtual teaching and learning right now, or IBM for that matter. Right now, it's in the form of micro-credentials that are very specifically targeted. But if these micro-credentials can be stacked up uh, into macro-credentials, and those macro-credentials can be stack stacked up into uh, a program that has specific learning outcomes, graduate attributes, graduate outcomes, uh, this is doable. I, I would say that uh, programs that are, for instance, in software engineering or software technology, computer science uh, are just ready for disruption. So what's the role of uh, bricks and mortar universities? The role of the bricks and mortar universities should be to double down on the student experience. Virtual teaching and learning does not produce a student experience that is as rich <clears throat> and valuable as um, as face-to-face -face interactions are. Uh, so what do I mean by that? I mean, what I mean by that is that the future belongs to humans. Today, we have many grand challenges that are facing us. If you take the opioid crisis, uh, no policymaker has been able to solve it. Uh, no scientist or engineer has been able to solve it. I mean, people are dying of the opioid crisis all over North America and in the Western world. If you take climate change, uh, it doesn't belong to one discipline. There's the interaction of the human with the technical, with the policy, and with other elements. So bricks and mortar universities have to double down on that human experience and have to realize that they largely focus on disciplinary competencies, which I think, um, which I will refer to as perishable skills. So for instance, we build up a competency in math but if someone doesn't use algebra, or if someone does not use uh, calculus, they forget some of the foundations of that math. So the disciplinary skills that we, uh, that, that we provide to graduates are inherently perishable, although they can be brushed up and they can be uh, regained later on. What bricks and mortars universities should place more emphasis on now are durable skills. Those durable skills are the skills that allow students or graduates to be creative and design solutions, to integrate multiple disciplines in order to solve problems, to be innovative, agile, understand that every solution must have a business case, to be able to work in multicultural and very diverse teams, to realize that they are part of a global community, but they must, in order to thrive, work on local solutions. So I think that's the challenge for BRICS and universities. Some universities today get it, and others, you asked about a, a global scan of universities, and others don't. So, so I think that the ones who don't get it, the future is fraught for them. Uh, there's a, 
I would say that there, is an, there are two intersecting themes here. One is a theme from the private sector in particular, industry, companies, and so on, who claim that graduates do not have the skills that they require in order for them to be truly effective the first day they walk in on a job. It used to be about 20 or 30 years ago, many companies had training programs, but they've done away with them. And they would like universities and higher education institutions to take on that responsibility. So if we don't rise to the challenge, the private sector will, and they will start to issue certificates, micro-credentials, which can be stacked up and which could ultimately lead to degrees. The other imperative is uh, fiscal. Uh, the huge debt and borrowing that jurisdictions have now because of the pandemic are going to make future investments in a variety of different areas uh, and maybe higher education more difficult for governments. So in addition to being agile, I think that universities have also learned, they have to learn how to be lean. And that is a very, very difficult conversation in universities because uh, uh, universities, not all universities, but some of them work on a sense of entitlement that there have been programs, there have been business propositions for a number of years, decades, and they should continue. And that's gonna be a very hard conversation. And that is going to leave people in leadership such as presidents and provosts in, in very, very tight and difficult situations. And um, you know, my sympathies are with them and my support is to them, but those are the very difficult conversations we are going to have. The universities that overcome these conversations are the ones that will thrive. The ones that don't will limp along, but uh, you know, their, their success may be in jeopardy. Okay, I'm going to pick up on a couple of, of threads that you left there, Ishwar. One is the criticism of some universities and perhaps higher education in general of being entitled. Um, and also earlier in your statement, the need for multidisciplinary diverse teams to work on these challenges. And I just want to Diverse, of course, not just in their knowledge, but also in their backgrounds and, and, and their identity. Um, and of course, 2020 will be known for the pandemic, but it will be known for something else as well. It's the year that the Black Lives Movement really didn't begin, but really became a worldwide phenomenon, which led to uh, challenges to many established institutions, including universities, for how they were going to change, how they were going to embrace uh, and, and diversify, uh, not on the time scale that universities are used to, but in a, in a much more rapid sense. Um, I'll begin with the provost again. Uh, can you perhaps comment on how McMaster uh, has McMaster's response at this point in time to the challenges that were issued to it from the Black Lives Movement. Right, and, and at McMaster, we actually have quite an active African Caribbean faculty um, association. So ACFAM is quite active and, and uh, they have been, um, you know, a group for some time. And so, so I guess part of the interesting aspect specifically dealing with the Black Lives Matter is we did have some um, experts on campus on our, at our institution who could really help guide us forward and provide some recommendations for how we would think about these complex issues. And, and I don't want to underline the fact these are really complex issues and issues that we need to be seriously tackling and dealing with collectively as a community. 
And so again, when I uh, joined and, and we started to look at things that we could do, there were some clear and obvious things that we could be supporting within the institution to really help advance not only our culture, but also be leaders. And so one of the initiatives um, that I was very pleased to help um, lead and work with my colleagues, the deans of engineering and our um, AVP equity and inclusion was a black cohort hire uh, faculty, which we really felt was important. It sent a very important signal and message. And also it really did showcase the fact that we are a community that is inclusive we value diversity and uh, we really wanted to make a strong statement. And I would say that that, that uh, is really an action speak louder than words. Um, I think uh, moreover, we're also looking across the board to look at other activities as well that can really um, showcase the fact that we wanna be inclusive. So we also have many um, ongoing activities and an interest in working with indigenous colleagues as another example of how we're really fostering diversity, inclusion and um, equity. Um, and, and one of the things that's really important to me is to ensure that we build a culture that is sustainable and that, um, that values um, our diversity. So ensuring we have appropriate training, ensuring um, that we foster collaboration. And I think you know, what it really comes down to is listening to others and collaborating. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, it has been a challenging time in society, but really it's enabled for us to have some very serious conversations about how we want to move forward. And um, also it's enabled us to really make a commitment and, and a commitment that we are a place that fosters inclusion and it's across the board. And so um, to me, again, that is a very positive part of this. We, you know, whenever we face challenge, we have to look at what that challenge is and really come up with solutions collectively as a, as a group of stakeholders come together so that we can advance. And I think that that, that is a, an absolutely important commitment that we can make at this point in time. I think there's a lot of reasons for why we need to be working at this. I, I wanna be clear, it's a journey. It's gonna take us time as we go down this, but I think the fact that we're having some of these difficult conversations, we again are listening and acting. And so to me, I think, I think it's, it's a positive step in the right direction, but it's by no means done that we need to continue to work at this and we will need to continue to work at this for some time. Uh, I, I, I know that equity, di diversity and inclusion has been one of the principles that you have advocated for since, since coming to McMaster. Uh, but I, in particular, what will the Black cohort hire mean for McMaster Engineering and what other kinds of initiatives maybe have been put into place both, both uh, some time ago and are currently being implemented? So I think uh, the uh, Black cohort hire is an enormous um, effort to the credit of Dr. Th uh, Dr. Time. Um, uh, she's um, made it possible that under the best of circumstances, uh, we could have 24 faculty members who might join uh, McMaster, uh, but uh, this may take time. Uh, we would have between 12 to 24 colleagues uh, in that cohort join McMaster. Uh, not all, of course, to the Faculty of Engineering, but spread out across the university. I mean, I think that's a terrific effort. Um, where I think that effort has to be leveraged is uh, with the pipeline. When we hire these uh, faculty members, uh, we have to support them and we have to make sure that they are successful. But we do that routinely. I think that that's a challenge, but it's a challenge we can meet. 
Another challenge that we must meet is providing access to individuals who don't have access right now because of racism, uh, because of uh, lack of means. So what we've done in the faculty is um, we've looked at various underrepresented demographics and we have actively um, raised philanthropic funds for them. So for instance, uh, we now have scholarships to identify students who don't have the means but come from uh, historically depressed areas, uh, such as the um, parts of the, uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> east end of uh, Hamilton. Uh, we have scholarships that uh, encourage women to enter engineering. Uh, with NSBE, there's a scholarship, the National Society of Black Engineers, there's a scholarship that's been established to bring in uh, black students to the Faculty of Engineering. We've established a fellowship for uh, uh, PhD students who are black or indigenous to enter the faculty. But I think that the pipeline has to be broadened, just as we are working on getting girls interested in STEM and in engineering, we have to have, uh, we're also uh, working with indigenous communities um, and we take youth camps to these communities to get them youth interest, indigenous youth interested in um, STEM, particularly engineering. We have to do that with black communities and other communities. Uh, we must have postdoctoral fellowships because it's not always usual for a PhD graduate to immediately get a position as a faculty member. We've got to improve their career outcomes also so that not only are they relevant for the academy after they get a PhD, but also for the private sector. We've got to work with uh, our corporate partners, you know, uh, by giving them co more, uh, uh, really effective co-op opportunities. So I think um, what I would say is that, as Dr. Tai said, it's a journey, but that journey involves uh, developing an infrastructure, and that infrastructure should really broaden the, the, the pipeline. All right, and and before we close, uh, I would be uh, in hot water with many people if I didn't press the provost uh, on a particular question, which is, do you have some of the world's leading experts in virology uh, in the pandemic response? I expect that you are the person to tell us whether we will be on campus in September. So can you tell us what your view is? Will we be back on campus uh, this fall? Yes, thank you, John, for that hot question. And of course, um, we have every intention to be on campus. Now, what that means is a bit of a moving target. And you're asking me this question in January. So given the dynamic nature uh, associated with um, getting access to vaccines and fully understanding contact tracing, et cetera, um, it, it's a challenging question to ask me right now. However, we are working on it. We've started to uh, plan and think about the fall 2021. Uh, you're right, we are going to be leveraging our experts here at McMaster. We have some of the best and the brightest who are doing research in COVID-19 and doing research and testing. And so they are advising um, myself and to figure out what plausible scenarios will be for the fall, and then how we can actually plan and manage and start to think about what will happen in the fall. Um, so, so that's ongoing right now. Um, my estimate is that we will probably come up with maybe three or four plausible scenarios and start to plan accordingly. Um, so best case scenario is, uh, which I don't know is totally feasible, everything on campus versus nothing on campus. Um, I think we're going to fall somewhere in the middle of that. And uh, that will be where, where we land. But we're absolutely going to be using um, information that comes available. 
I would also say that we also have very close ties and collaborations with public health, Hamilton Public Health, and uh, we will enlist their support. And uh, so, so the plan is that we will be on campus. We do understand that many of our um, many institutions are planning this way, but I just want to reinforce that we do have some really important guiding principles and the first and most important one will be, we will only be on campus if it is safe. So, um, and we also will make the commitment to communicate. And again, I think that the more we can communicate and be clear in what we know and where we plan to be, the better it will be for all of our um, faculty, staff, and students. So we, we really do, um, we're gonna list whatever help we can get. We're gonna listen to the experts and then we're gonna make some decisions. And I also wanna reinforce that we're gonna work closely across the institution. Um, you know, our faculty deans, Dean Puri and others, um, our other experts who look after uh, the residences, um, our other administration groups, we're going to be working together to come up with a solution. Thanks for listening to this episode of Big Ideas for a Changing World. This show was produced by Jesse Park and edited by Dan Kim of the Faculty of Engineering. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or let us know your thoughts on social media. We're at McMaster Engineering on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. See you next time.